Hello and welcome back to another episode of LOCAD TV. This week we're going to be discussing modularization, the process of subdividing a company's computer processes from one standalone system to a number of other subprograms or even apps. As always, I'm joined by Johannes Vermeerout. So Johannes, um, what part of a business's processes are we talking about making more modular today? So um, we, are, we are talking of especially the IT infrastructure and the IT landscape, uh, the, uh, the applicative landscape of your company. So modularization is, is interesting because when you, um, I would say, when you think about the physical world, it's pretty obvious that supply chains are incredibly modular. Actually, they are probably the most modular things ever invented by, uh, by humanity. So um, what do I mean by, by, by modular in this case? I mean that, um, you know, if you want to transport goods by road, you can use trucks. Trucks are incredibly modular, first because you can put pretty much anything that is not exceeding the capacity of a truck in a truck. And then a, a truck can drive on any road and it can go from any warehouse to any warehouse. So you see, it's, so basically you, you can literally, uh, if you need extra trucks, you could pretty much take any kind of trucks, almost it's not exactly true, but, and it, they can actually add transportation capacity to, um, to your supply chain. Same thing like pallets, you can put pretty much anything on a pallet, again, as long as it doesn't exceed capacity. Same thing for a container, a container is extremely modular, you can put whatever you want in a container, you can even move the container from um, a cargo ship to a truck, so all those pieces and then pretty much anything that is not too small, you can put a barcode in. So you see that's great, incredibly modular invention. Um, if you have something that is like a diamond, you would probably start put diamond in the box and then put the barcode on top of the box. But this is it, you, you, you can combine, you know, all those elements that are very simple at will nearly infinitely. I mean, it's very Lego-like, you know, it's, 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 it's simple parts that you can combine in, I would say, in incredibly varied ways. So that's the physical supply chain, which is incredibly modular. And then the interesting thing is that when you move to the IT world, then we enter um, a, a perspective that is uh, completely different and where frequently modularization is literally entirely lost. And um, I think the, the origin of that dates from, I would say, the early 70s or 80s where, where companies started to have their first systems, computer systems, and their first ERP implementations. So what you're saying is that those initial implementations, those initial IT systems, because they were very much sort of a singular approach, that's still what we're using today? Is that what you're saying? Yes, I mean, think when, when you think back, you know, at the, the, the IT or software 70s, 80s, or even, even the early 90s, um, doing anything over the network was like rocket science. I mean, it was possible. There, there is the, 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 the history of computer networking goes back, you know, to, to the 60s. But um, I would say in, in even in the early, as late as the early 90s, um, the idea of building an app that is like distributed, uh, so it, it's many machines on many locations and they, they communicate uh, with the network was literally uh, an engineering nightmare. So it was much easier to say, we take one big machine, uh, you know, um, ideally, an, I would say an IBM mind frame of the time, and you put all your logic on these machines, and then everybody is using like a, a terminal that is connected to this machine. And then we have all the logic that is like um, running in a big monolith on this machine. So what do you mean by monolith? So monolith, I mean that it's, it's like an app that is uh, a wall and that it cannot be taken apart. You know, it, it, it has to be together or it's nothing. Okay, I'm afraid I'm a bit of a millennial, so this kind of idea might predate me a little bit. But basically what we're saying is that everything is being connected to one single machine, correct? And then we're all connecting and we're all working from that. Exactly, I mean, mindframes were relatively complex hardware things, so it was, even if it was one machine, it had many parts, you know, many drives, many CPUs, many things. But fundamentally, it was a design that was extremely coherent and, and, and wall. And um, the type of application that you could have on top, uh, and that was, we are mostly talking about ERPs, I mean, enterprise resource, not actually planning, but enterprise resource management uh, system that is running on this, on this, uh, on this system, um, is, 
was typically designed as extensible but not modular, meaning that you can potentially activate some extra capabilities and features on adding things on top, but um, you cannot take those capabilities apart to keep them um, you know, fully isolated and fully, fully separated. So the interesting thing is that um, what, what really changed was probably the, the, the internet and the general internet. I'm not referring to the fact that it, the internet was invented. I'm more referring to the fact that um, during the late 90s, what changed was with the internet becoming very, very popular, uh, people started to think about how you can design software so that you take the parts uh, in isolation and you have the network in the middle and the whole thing is not an engineering nightmare. So you see, it was, it, the, the networking was already present, but the point is that if you do not know how to build you know, a complex uh, software system that is made of many parts having a network in the middle, then, then prior to that, it was an engineering nightmare because literally the know-how was, was not there. And this know-how and culture and tools and everything mostly I would say emerge as a byproduct of, of, of the internet, of the, of the adoption of the internet by the general public. So the internet's been around for a long time now. So why are we still talking about modularization? Why are these software still kind of acting in this kind of single manner? Because it's, it's, it's very interesting. Um, again, right now my diagnosis is that when you, when you take the average company that is operating, you know, your average complex supply chain, so multinational, many locations, many plants, many warehouses, many channels to distribute the goods. Um, everything physical is incredibly modular, but when we start looking at the, the IT, it's completely, it's, it's, it's chunks of big monolith. And those monoliths, the, the interesting thing is that, um, uh, because I think companies and the, the market at large is, is still ha having trouble to really apprehend the value of having something that is, ex that is extremely modular, IT-wise, I mean, physically-wise, it's pretty obvious and all supply chains are really still improving their, their modularity. But in terms of applicative landscape, it's, it's, it's more abstract, it's more difficult to, to perceive the modularity as such. And so what did happen is that you have many vendors who just took, I would say, old monolith architecture and just, you know, slightly upgraded those, those architecture toward SaaS and the cloud, but just copy and paste. So it's fundamentally the same sort of architecture that you had in, uh, I would say, um, an IBM mind frame in the 90s, where you just decided that instead of having a machine uh, at your company's headquarters that run the thing, you just decide to delegate the thing to um, a software vendor that operates as SaaS, software as a service. But fundamentally, if the software as a service vendor is only having um, a monolith that they run on a machine that is just far from your headquarters with just a bit of networking with web user interface in the middle, it doesn't add anything as far modularization is concerned. It just makes maintenance easier, that's, that's taken. But in terms of modularization, it means that when you will want to take the features apart, uh, you will be still faced with a monolith that where this sort of, of capabilities cannot happen. So what's the problem with this mo monolithic approach? How is it affecting companies in the real world? Um, I mean, just imagine if you, again, just imagine the, the physical equivalent of lack of modernization. Imagine that in your supply chain, whenever you want to change one truck, you have to change them all. Imagine that, for example, uh, if you change from one truck to another, you need a different type of gasoline. So that means that all, all your circuits to basically have, have gas for, for, your, for your trucks would need to be changed, meaning that you have reservoirs that contain gas, where you would need like a second type of gas. That, that would be an immense pain, you see. So, so and the, the software equivalent of that is that when you lack modernization, it's, it's, it's exactly like if you change one of, the, one of the parts, you need to change them all. So if you change one truck, you need to change all your fleets. Or imagine if um, you change the shelves of one warehouse and you would need to change all the shelves of all the other warehouse, otherwise it's not compatible. And, and then you realize, okay, I can maybe 
for example, maybe I can decide to upgrade my fleet of trucks toward electric trucks. But that's going to be a massive strategic move uh, and it's, it's very complicated and, uh, and actually you would still prefer to have something relatively modular where you can have you know, electric trucks and, and, and combustion trucks that can coexist you know, gracefully for, for, for a long period of time. Uh, but, but when you lack modernization, what means that you, you cannot have this sort of coexistence. You cannot change you know, some bits of your supply chain there without changing everything. And just to give you, you know, the, 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 what I see as the most frequent, I would say, anecdotal evidence of this lack of modernization is that for companies to move from one warehouse to another, physically, it could be done in like a day where you just move the stuff physically that is sitting in a warehouse on the shelves of warehouse A to the shelves of warehouse B. I mean, with a f sufficient amount of manpower, it could be done in a day. But to migrate the software that was connected to warehouse A so that now everything knows that all the stuff is in, is in the, s the system that drives warehouse B, mm -hmm. that would take like uh, six months. And that's that's the interesting thing is that. So how do like big companies do this? If they're existing on this monolithic kind of system, how do they migrate to a, a more sort of a different system? So I think that again we are we are going to go back to one of the company that we mentioned in pretty much every single episode or something like Amazon. Going to ring our <laughs> Amazon bell again. Yes, yeah. but <laughs> they are not the only one who who did adopt an uh, I would say an extremely modular approach um, in, in Germany. Zalando. Um, you can follow on the blogs, have now also fully adopted a very, very modular approach. And the key word I would say in IT for this, when you want to have those, this modularity, is probably um, uh, service-oriented architecture, SOA. Um, so service-oriented architecture basically means that you want to isolate capabilities in, in chunks that are themselves like small monolith, but much smaller, and uh, that they are very well scoped in t centered to do like one thing and do it well. And you plug all those things together through your service oriented architecture, which means that every single um, service actually, in the sense it's an app that do one thing and do it well, um, every single service expose APIs, application programming interface, so that it can be glued into your applicative landscape very easily because it's, it's literally designed to be easily pluggable programmatically into, um, into any arbitrary applicative landscape without making almost no assumptions on what, is, what are the other parts of the applicative landscape. So um, Amazon, I think um, Jeff Bezos basically published a very famous memo, I believe in 12, 2002, maybe 2004, but no, probably 2002, where they, they published a, a very famous memo where um, to all his teams where he say, I want to have every single division needs to have um, service-oriented architecture with APIs so that the data that you have in your, in your silo can be exported where, to be exploited in any other, uh, I would say, division in the company and we can interact programmatically with whatever you're building. Okay. The problem I really sort of see with this though is you're becoming reliant on a lot of smaller apps, smaller programs, smaller companies ultimately. I mean, doesn't that introduce a lot more single points of failure? Whereas if you're having a more monolithic approach, you've got sort of one solid large company, one large ERP system that will always be running and you've got more confidence in it. So, I mean, it's true. And, and to some extent, that's one of the challenge of a distributed system is that if um, for example, if your hardware fail 1% of the time, uh, then that means that if you have like a mainframe, uh, let's say 1% a day, you know, as a failure rate, that would mean that three times a year you have, uh, you have a breakdown. If suddenly you have 10 apps, uh, each one being down uh, with 1% chance on any given day, it means on every 10 days you have something that is down in your network. So indeed, um, it's a challenge. And uh, so what are the, the, situation, the, the solution for that? I mean, first is, I would say, redundancy. But I, I'm talking about first, I, I will discuss maybe the, the, the implication term of distributed computing, and maybe then discuss the fact that you have small companies versus large companies and you know, disparity within vendors. So from a distributed, um, I would say, computing viewpoint, what you try is that every single block 
is itself going to be highly redundant. That's the essence of cloud computing. You have so something that is heavily, heavily redundant software-wise, so that you're always on. So your uptime is 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 very, very high. And the good news is that because your your apps are smaller and simpler, it's much easier to achieve very, very high uptime with a a small, simple app than it is to achieve a high uptime with a, a very, very complex app. And basically, on the internet, you have plenty of of um, of, of, of component services that are literally always on. I mean, Gmail, uh, Google Mail is literally always on. Uh, uh, Yahoo, the, the website, even if they are not the, the web leader that they are, is basically always on. I mean, it, again, you, you can have many things, uh, subcomponents that are, if well engineered, can be literally always on. Facebook is, let's say, also always on. So it's, it's possible to engineer this always on property for those apps. And that, that, I would say, address, I would say, your reliability of the system as a whole. Um, and then you have another angle, which is indeed, what about transitioning from one large vendor to many small vendors? Well, the reality is that um, I believe failure rates in software is very high. Um, people fail to realize that maybe, you know, um, software initiatives fail something like half of the time in, 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 in companies. Uh, I would say my ballpark would be probably between a third or between a third and half of the, um, the, uh, the supply chain IT projects fail for companies of, of pretty much any size anyway. So have we got a so good example for this week of a company uh, I mean, that's yeah, tried I mean this a few, and failed? A few weeks ago there was uh, Lidl in Germany who basically busted a, something like half a billion euro on a, on a failed SAP transition um, so uh, yeah it was it was pretty bad and pretty spectacular I, I forget it was like a seven years project half a billion euro and okay. all burst and basically uh, and and in the end they did completely give up but it's not the only example it happens very frequently uh, and again I'm not so I would say that probably large vendors have a better success rate but just in terms of, 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 of ballpark we are talking of basically going, let's say, from um, a small vendor might have like a 50% failure rate, which is pretty bad, but the big vendor is going to have like a 30% failure rate. So it's not like you transition from the small company that is like 50% to uh, where one time out of two it fails to the large company where it's one time out of 1,000. No, it's, it's like you go, yes, going for a large vendor typically um, uh, I would say diminish your risk a little, but only a little. Which, if you think it through, um, if you go for a, 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 an approach where you ha you're exceedingly modular, yes, you will have many things that will fail, but you will have the opportunity to try again and repeat until you have success. You see, because that the thing is that if you have like 10 components, every component has like one chance out of two to fail, you can still iterate every single component a couple of times uh, until, until it actually works. And because the scope is simpler, uh, the app itself is, 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 is smaller, you can basically fail fast and, and, and retry. Because the thing is that, uh, as we see with the Lido approach, is that I'm pretty sure that initially they were not trying to, to have like a seven years migration. It was probably like a, a two years migration that turned into a three year migration and a four year migration extra because they were failing, reiterating and refailing and reiterating until seven years down the road, they finally decided to, to give up probably at some point. Okay. Uh, everybody had even lost, I mean, lost any hope for the project to succeed. Okay, so if we agree that those apps, once you find the right one, maybe you iterate a bit, but you find the right one, they seem to work and they seem to be doing the same job as a larger sort of system. What about the crossover between those apps? Because a lot of the time an app would do something else well and there might be a little bit of crossover and conflict within that system. How do you sort of manage that? I mean, yeah, I mean, first, um, you, you really want when you choose, basically it's the composition of your applicative landscape, you really want to choose apps that have a, a narrow scope, which by the way, goes completely against what most uh, RFP requests for proposal when there is, you know, companies that are seeking to acquire a piece of software, they, they go for an RFP and they want to have like 
everything, you know, all features, all bells and whistle. But that's the opposite that you should seek. You want to have something that is extremely narrow so that by design you minimize your overlaps. Because if you're buying like large frameworks, uh, you, it, it's a recipe to have overlaps. And by the way, enterprise vendors, their interest is to sell you large frameworks because they can extend with many, many features. So they sell you something and then they will sell you the add-ons on top of it. But so, so I would say to, 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 to um, people running large supply chain, I would say my message would be, be very careful of, of, of when you're being sold a platform because the problem is that a platform is good but two platforms is a nightmare. And w as soon as you, you have several vendors that are selling you platforms, you will end up with like a sea of overlaps. So that I think so that's the recipe is carefully choosing the composition of, of what the ingredients. And then in terms of glue, uh, the, um, the approach is that it's typically something that you want to develop internally. So that might go against the intuition of why do you want to even develop any kind of software in-house? Well, the answer is that if you're um, a, a company of a certain size, your applicative landscape anywhere is completely unique to you. Even if, if all the apps, because you will need multiple apps. I mean, there is no way that you, you will have an ERP nowadays that do, you know, emails, uh, video conferencing, and what not, you know, you, you cannot push every single software features that you need into one app. Um, you, you will probably use Microsoft Excel like everybody else. So uh, you will need to have like a place to store files and whatnot. So you, you, it's not realistic to say we have one piece of software. Uh, any company that is of any significant size is going to be a collection of software anyway. So the problem is that your, your you know, your mileage, your the exact I would say recipe that is the list of software that literally run your company, it's going to be something that is completely unique to you anywhere. So you don't have, because, the, and there will be no other op company that is organized exactly like you. Um, so anywhere, I would say, because it's, it's completely unique, that's your DNA, um, you can have this glue that you implement in-house, and that's the whole point of the service-oriented architecture is to make this glue as simple and lean to implement so that you can have a very, uh, a very lean IT team uh, that has like minimal efforts to do to come up with this custom software that just glue things together. Okay, um, and to sort of wrap things up, if I'm a CEO, how do I avoid another little type uh, disaster? Um, so first, I, I think it's, you need to think risk instead of minimizing the risk because you see little type disaster was people that say we want to take no risk whatsoever and so we go for the biggest vendor out there and we we try to have the product that does everything so basically it's i would say it's the approach where you say we want something that is like correct by design and we we want to to roll out something that I would say upgrade the whole company at once. I would say this is the worst type of approach in terms of risk management. You need to, 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 to think completely the opposite, which is how can I have something that will fail fast if, if it has to fail? So you see, the problem with the risk is that as when you have this massive, massive project is that you, you do not know for a long period of time whether you failed or not. What you want is to do it um, uh, something that is more fail fast where you know if you failed and um, the failure has, is a small scale and if you need to have a replacement you have a scope that is manageable and, and you do that with many small chunks so, so think of it as opposed of, of preventing the rate again I'm saying that you know going from a large vendor to a small vendor you might increase the risk from 30% chance of failure to 50% but in the end you know if 30% chance of failure means that your company go bankrupt or, or that the supply chain grinds to a halt. It's not a risk that you can take. So you have to plan for failure anyway. So that, that's my, my thinking is that because failure, uh, a high degree of risk is unavoidable, mm -hmm. directly go for a uh, plan for failure and try to have like small failure, fast failure, well scoped failure so that you can, you can iterate as opposed to saying we are doing to do everything 
do it right, do it the first time, which is like, I would say, wishful thinking. And then uh, I would say on board on a journey that can just like little last seven years to finally lose half a billion euro yeah. uh, in the process of, of, of chasing this, is, this, this kind of wishful thinking about, uh, about project management. Okay, great. I like it. The low cut tip of the day. If you're going to fail, fail fast. <laughs> yes. Brilliant. So that's uh, everything for this week. We'll be back again next week with yet another episode. Until then, thanks for watching.